from Acts chapter 1, or chapter 2, uh, begin at verse 1. You all follow that? <laughs> chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven and in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said they're filled with new wine. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven, above, and signs on the earth below, blood, and fire, and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thank, Thank you, God. Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Come, let us build a name for ourselves. That's what they said as they were building the Tower of Babel up into the heavens, and that's what we've been saying ever since, and what we've been doing. Trump Tower, Eiffel Tower, Leaning Tower of Pisa. We build our cities, our buildings, our towers up into the heavens, try to build bigger and nicer buildings. We build our careers, we build our portfolios, we build our reputations, we build our Facebook page or whatever else they got going on these days. I, I can't keep up with it. But all of the social media, we try to build and make a name for ourselves, right? We do it with our religion, too. We can build, build or big, <laughs> we can build bigger buildings. <laughs> and we can couch it all in pious terms that we're trying to build a name for God, but sometimes the temptation and motivation can be building a bigger and better name for ourselves, right? Last Sunday, we hosted the baccalaureate worship service here at St. Luke for Mount Spokane High School. It's the second year in a row we've done that, and it's, it's always interesting to me when we host some sort of public event and have people from the community come and are here for the first time. I'm always interested to see what their reactions are and what they have to say over here, you know, eavesdrop. <laughs> it's usually two things when they come into our worship space. One is that they're often surprised to see chairs lined up on the side and in the back and that uh, mainline denominational church is growing and full. They're usually surprised about that. And then usually they're not very impressed with the facilities. They don't find it to be very attractive. And if that's offensive to you and you're hurt by that, get over it. It's what it is. <laughs> but uh, that usually plays back into the first part that they're surprised. It's like, why does anybody come here? And, uh, and I, I was saying to my kids afterwards, you know, I'm always kind of proud of the fact that people are here. <laughs> I mean, number one, in this culture, in the Pacific Northwest, that anybody comes to church, period, 
uh, and chooses on a beautiful Sunday like this to be in church on a Sunday morning. Secondly, that if it's not the facility that's all awe-inspiring and beautiful and why people want to be here, it's for the ministry, right? I said the challenge is going to be when we do build a new sanctuary, and if it is beautiful, if it is awe-inspiring, if it does attract people, that we not make it about the building, right? That we keep it about the ministry and what we're about. And what we're about is building living stones, stones that will shout out our hosannas and our hallelujahs to the Lord. Stones that are pointing, a ministry that is pointing to Christ and making Christ known whether it's in our worship or whether it's in our works and our deeds as brothers and sisters in Christ and how we live our lives and how we point to Christ. Serving the neighbor, especially those in need and one another, loving one another in the world. But we can certainly uh, try to make a name for ourselves with our own religion, can't we? And uh, whether it's successful church, or maybe sometimes we do that as individual Christians in our own kind of righteousness. I was at a gathering of a bunch of Christians recently, and, and most of them are not, well, I don't know if there were any of them who had any Lutheran background. And so it was a culture and a Christianity that I'm not really familiar with and wasn't real comfortable with, because part of what I guess I wasn't comfortable with is everybody leading it. It seemed like it was a competition of super-Christianity. You know, where everybody got up and was trying to outdo the next person and just how Christian they were. It's like every other word had to be about Jesus. I mean, it's like they couldn't go to the bathroom without praying to Jesus or praising Jesus and everything came out okay. I mean, it, and I thought, you know, I, I felt bad about what I said last Sunday in my sermon uh, about having coffee hour and never talking about Jesus. It's just a social club. And, and that can happen in some churches. That's the other extreme where nothing's about Jesus. You wonder why they're gathering. Uh, but the other extreme is that every other word has to be about Jesus. Can't we just have coffee together and enjoy each other's fellowship once in a while? Does every other word have to be about Jesus? So I think there are these extremes. But there is this temptation to want to make a name for ourselves, right? Whether it's successful church or super Christian, powerful preacher, or the faithful, the committed, the obedient. We can try to make a name for ourselves with our own religion. Now, the flip side of the coin is that there are those who try to make a name for themselves in their rebellion and rejection of religion. You see that today in this kind of narcissistic nihilism going on. You hear it in phrases like, you just do you and I'll do me, right? Coca-Cola commercials, just do you. And it seems that being true to the self is the highest goal in God, right? Now, what if just doing you is being a rapist or a murderer. We say, well, of course not that. As long as it's not harmful to anyone else, then you just do you and I'll do me. And we've made the self, this narcissistic self, we've made into the new golden calf. And we sacrifice on its altar the neighbor and society. The neighbor and society has taken a way big back seat. Because it seems the highest goal and aim is being true to the self. You hear it in other forms and shapes taking place in our society today, and sometimes in more of a pious persona. You hear people say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Have you ever heard that before? Uh huh. And then you hear talk about uh, the universe, right? And you hear all sorts of people talking about the universe being good to you and all that kind of stuff, and, and about... Uh, positivity and positive energy. I had a friend who was in the hospital recently and she had family and friends who were sending positive energy her way. It used to be that we sent prayers your way, you know. <laughs> but now it's positive energy and, and hoping that the universe smiles upon you. It used to be that we hoped and prayed that God would be good to you, but now it's the universe. Now why is it that the universe and positive energy is less threatening than God and prayer? I'll tell you why. Because, see, the universe makes no demands on you. You don't have to confess your sin or acknowledge any sin to the universe. The universe makes no judgment on you. The universe never says to you, put down your weapon and take up your cross. The universe never makes commandments like honor the Sabbath. 
It's not okay just to do you and do whatever you want. There needs to be a day set aside to acknowledge God and that you're answerable to someone. The universe never says to you, give a tithe that doesn't belong to you in the first place. The universe doesn't say to you, love your enemy. It just says, you do you. If you just want to love your friends, that's fine. Now, it takes many shapes and forms the way that we try to make a name for ourselves today. You've heard me complain about the whole coexist bumper sticker, but for those who are new, I'm going to tell you because everybody else is sick of it, but you listen. Uh, the whole coexist bumper sticker with all the different religious symbols or tolerance is another one. Started off as with good intentions, honorable intentions, to want to create dialogue between religions and not create enemies, right? That's all good. But it's become its own religion. And people now put that as their religious motto that I pick a little from Christianity, a little from Judaism, a little from Hinduism, a little from Buddhism, a little from Islam, and I create my own God in my own liking, my own religion. The suggestion by many who want to do that is that, well, in the end, all roads lead to Rome anyway, don't they? And which is just completely insulting to every one of those religions who say, no, our end leads and makes its end in heaven. And another says, no, it's in righteousness. And another says, no, it's in reincarnation to a better state. And another says, it's nirvana. And the reality is, every one of them says, no, the humanist movement of today, just be a good person and uh, care for creation and uh, take care of those in need and seek justice. All these things, all these religions purport, but I don't need religion to tell me that. I can just be a good person on my own. That much may be true. And yet all the religions say, but there is a difference among us too that we want to honor. Now here's the difference with Christianity to all of that, Judeo-Christian thought. It is the belief that we do not secure our own existence and we do not generate life from within. That life comes ex nihilo, which is a Latin fancy way of saying out of nothing, from beyond. That none of us can generate life from within ourselves. We are dependent on what we call God. The whole Tower of Babel story is about the human impulse to want to secure life by ourselves. The human impulse to want to say that we are in charge, I want to make a name for myself and not have something imposed upon me. Right? It's the age-old sin that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the tempter who says, is, don't listen to religion. Is that what religion says? Is that what God tells you? Because they just want you to conform. They just want to have control of you. Exercise your freedom. You just do you. Right? And as the psalmist says, the one who sits in the heavens laughs <laughs> and has them in derision. The confusion upon the people at the Tower of Babel and that's still going on today is from God. And if there is any hope of that reversing, it is by God's grace and the work of God and the Holy Spirit which we hear in the story of Pentecost. There is a gift that has been given to you. It is a name that has been put upon you. And in your baptism, God has given you the name church. He's given you the name the body of Christ. He's given you the name of one who belongs to Christ Jesus and therefore has a holy purpose and calling. You have been given a name in your baptism and it is Christian. It is one who belongs to Jesus Christ. You are the sheep of His fold and the lamb of His flock and the sinner of His redeeming. You are His beloved. You are a child of God. You are the redeemed. You are forgiven. There is a name above every name that one day every knee will bow to and every tongue confess. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And as Peter preaches on Pentecost, Everyone who calls upon this name will be saved. And when he says everyone, he means anyone and everyone who calls on this name. Creed and Arab. Uh, Crete and Arab. Uh, 
uh, Mesopotamian and Mede, Phrygian and Pamphylian, American and North Korean, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, gay and straight, Lutheran and Presbyterian, uh, Roman Catholic and non-denominational. Yes, the agnostic and the atheist have this promise too. In the midst of all of our confusion, all of the confusion within and from without, there stands this single simple promise. Call upon the name of the Lord and ye shall be saved. So go ahead and enjoy your coffee. <laughs> Go home and kiss your kids. Pet your dog. Even love a cat. I'm a dog person, sorry. Go to work. Serve your neighbor. Seek justice. Help those in need. Confess your sin, for confession is good for the soul. And sin boldly, believing and trusting even more boldly in the mercy of God and the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And as you leave church or go from high school to ventures of which we know not the end, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown, go with faith and good courage knowing not where it leads, but only that God's hand is leading you, that Jesus' love is supporting you. And the Holy Spirit will be with you and never leave you or forsake you so that we can say with confidence, the Lord who's given me a name, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Amen.